All right, are there other council requests for Mr. Uh, Shields? If not, why don't we go on and uh, I guess the report of the city manager, do you have a report tonight, Mr. Shields, or are you yielding the floor to uh, our friends on the school board? So uh, Mayor Tarter, tonight is uh, budget presentation night and uh, as our city clerk has laid it out on the agenda, we have the school board uh, going first to present the budget and then I will follow uh, behind that if that's the pleasure of council uh, in that order. And so let me, uh, if I may, turn it over. Of course. To, uh, turn it over to uh, uh, Superintendent Noonan and Chair of the School Board, uh, Ms. Laura Downs, and they will uh, provide a briefing to the City Council on the School Board budget request. All right, welcome. Thank you. This is my assistant, Dr. Peter Noonan. <laughs> 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 thank you all uh, for having us this evening. On behalf of the school board, the superintendent, and his staff, I want to thank you again for having us this evening. The school board has worked hard on this uh, budget, but I know that it's only a small component of your much larger budget. And we understand you have a lot to consider as you address the needs of the city and its residents, and we just thank you for your support and your partnership. We're going to get started. I know that um, in advance we sent you these slides, so I'm going to briefly skim over them um, for, so that any public members that are watching, they will be able to see the slides. But I know that you all have seen them in advance, so I won't go too in depth. Okay, and, and some of you may remember our placemat from a couple years ago. This is our updated placemat, and as you'll see, the center is our students, always our students. And you'll see our, in terms of our mission, our three pillars, IB for all, equity, closing, which is our closing our gaps, and then our caring, promoting a caring culture. Uh, so IB for all, um, when we talk about that, that's um, even though when students are not taking um, on the IB diploma track, all of our students take IB courses. So we really are IB for all. And it's very timely because we just had IB here last week um, giving, uh, assessing our program. And we passed with flying colors. And uh, right now they're here this week assessing the um, elementary school's IB program. And uh, so that's an exciting time for us. Doing it? There we, go. Uh, we are in the middle of a strategic planning um, initiative that kicked off in August. And right now we're, at, we're towards the end at the design and launch phase. Uh, what's really impressive about this is we had over 1,000 individuals participate in the feedback gathering component. Um, through focus groups and town halls and surveys. And what came of that is, uh, oops, sorry, there we go. Uh, what came of that is we came up with some core values, um, focus, focusing on academic success, being student-centered, inclusion and belonging, responsive and accountable, and community and connection. And from there, we developed focus areas. And so the first is IB-infused teaching and learning. And, and as I said before, we are right now going through a self-study process with IB. Um, inclusion, belonging, and wellness. And this is something that um, our uh, participants said that this was very important to them, that we, we included inclusion, belonging, and wellness. Resource management, continuous improvement, communication and engagement, and investing in our people. And here we are, our beautiful high school. This is the hype tunnel. My son is actually on there. He's towards the back. He's a big guy, not so fast, so he's towards the back. This is our hype tunnel, though, and we um, want to thank the city council. Whoops. Sorry, went ahead. Um, we want to thank the city council for your partnership on this. We uh, not only was this, you know, one of the things that I think got sort of overshadowed during COVID was that this beautiful building was delivered on time and actually under budget by our superintendent especially impressive during COVID. And in fact, we came in $100,000 under budget and that money will be returned to the general government. And so looking at our FY22 approved revenue, revenue and expenditures, sort of as we've seen over the years, um, the same numbers we are um, in terms of our expenditures, um, I'm sorry, our revenue, we see 81.5% coming from our local revenue from our city. And looking at our expenditures, we see 86% of our uh, expenditures coming in, uh, going towards salaries and benefits. And here we have a chart on enrollment. And if, uh, to just go over this, and I know you've all seen these numbers, so I won't go too, too in depth, but 
Um, our enrollment as of September 2021, which is what our um, state aid is based on, was 2,500 uh, and two, which is down about 14 from the previous year. Um, but that's still, we haven't returned to our pre-COVID numbers. Um, so we're still about 160 students off. We actually, this number might be a little bit higher because um, you may know that we've welcomed, uh, it might be more, but I know it's at least 12 families from Ukraine over the past couple weeks. So that number actually might be a little bit higher. So we're above the, uh, this, yep. So that, that's just from September and that was the numbers we sent to the state. So we are above. And here's a, uh, just giving you an idea of what, what we're seeing around the region. Um, it's most of Northern Virginia has seen drops over the past two years. And um, you'll see that ours has um, more recently has uh, started to um, become more flat and not quite as pronounced there. What's interesting about this slide is even though our enrollment has um, been sort of flat and, and declined a little bit since COVID, you'll see that under students with disabilities, we've actually had an increase in the proportion of those students. So that's something that we still need to really keep in mind. Um, what is nice, what, what's helpful about that is that when we had a reduction in students, we did not reduce the number of our special education staff. So we feel confident that we'll still be able to serve those students. Okay, and then um, factors in impacting um, FY23 projections. Uh, looking at the, um, the Weldon Cooper, that's the company or the uh, firm we use to project uh, our population or, or where our student population will be. And um, they're, what, they've, what we're seeing is that over, since 2016, there was a decline in the number of um, families moving into the city. And that really was causing some of, our pan, some of our enrollment to decline even before the pandemic. Over the next decade, we, we anticipate that there'll be a decline in births. And then that might even out towards the end of the decade, we might see the, the births start to increase again in the city. Okay, and th these are looking at our projections. Uh, Dr. Noonan and Ms. Michael came to the school board to talk about when we look at projections to try to figure out budgeting. And the board did feel that we should go to use our short ter term projections, which are the most conservative of the three. We thought that would be the best um, given just sort of the, what's been happening the, over the past couple years. So we are going more conservative on our projections. Uh, and this is to note, this does not include Jesse Thackeray. So the numbers might, if, if you see the numbers are a little off, that's why that is. Okay, and just to, again, to reemphasize that we are very grateful for the collaborative partnership we have for you all, with you all. Uh, for the past three years, we've, our budget has fallen within budget guidance. And we know that, you know, the partnership between the school board, the city council, um, the administrative side of the school system and our general government is really vital to the city's success. Now, it, for those who are watching, um, you may not know that the school board and the city council met in December to go over city council guidance. And at that time, uh, we, there was, we understood that there would be an a, a cre increased assessed value of real estate in which, of course, we know from over the past week that that has indeed come true. Uh, so what we talked about was really that we wanted to see a tax rate reduction between zero and four cents um, to give some relief to homeowners. And that, was also, that would also take into account the elimination of the grocery tax. Also that at that meeting, we all decided as a school board and a city council that recruitment and retention of our employees was very valuable and that we needed to stay competitive. Okay, and then also during the December 6th meeting, we talked about organic growth revenue and that was forecasted to be 8.4%. And if the governor was to eliminate the grocery tax, it would be down to 6.3%. Talked about the revenue uh, sharing methodology and that any revenue coming in above guidance would be shared 50-50. And again, the funding requested by our school system of 6.3 does fall within that organic growth revenue uh, guidance range. And we'll go through this real quickly. State revenue um, will account for 15.4% of the, of, the uh, of the school board budget. State aid's coming in at 527,000. Sales tax, 422,000. I have it down there. 
am I off here? Yep, okay. Other revenue, um, federal revenue comes in at 19,000. We're still having a beginning balance of 450,000. Um, our other revenue, which comes from tuition from out of city uh, students, fees, stop arm camera fines, um, facility rentals, that sort of thing comes in at 841,000. Thank you. Dr. Noonan just informed me that is a decrease in federal revenue. That's right. Thank you, Dr. Noonan. Um, in terms of, let's see, there we go. Um, our advertised budget revenue, uh, again, we thank the, the local um, community, 81.1% 81 81 of our budget comes from the localities. When we combine that with the aid received from the state, that's 96.5% of our budget. And we'll talk about compensation a little bit here. Sorry, I'm not a very good pick. Okay, there we go. Seven point, I'm not very skilled at this pointer thing. Okay, so uh, in terms of employee compensation, well, this, we're gonna look at expenditures overall. So employee compensation, we're looking at uh, $2.7 million. And, and again, as we all know, our, just as the city council and the general government, your employees are important, our employees are important. They're really our highest priority. Uh, working conditions, uh, positive employee working conditions really um, deliver a positive student learning environment. And just looking again at after COVID, um, increasing our focus on social and emotional well-being and academic supports. In terms of employee compensation, uh, we are going to give our employees, we're one step. And for those employees who uh, worked for us in uh, fiscal year 2021, they did miss a step that year. So we are going to do a recovery step. And those two steps combined are going to be equivalent to $1.6 million. We're also going to be giving a 2.25 cost of living increase, which will total $890,000, $677. So that um, is really one of the things that you all know. We already had a teacher shortage before COVID. Uh, teachers across the country are leaving in droves. So this is something that we really need to um, make a priority. And um, as we have learning that Arlington County, which is one of the school systems we compete most with for teachers, they're doing a salary study right now and they are um, looking at doing four missteps. Um, and so we really anticipate that their, uh, their salaries will really skyrocket. So we need to really keep, um, do, our, do the best we can to uh, remain competitive. That's an average of 11%, Dr. Newton informs me. And that's right, that's in Arlington. Okay, employee compensation. Uh, a couple other highlights with employee compensation. Uh, we are increasing the National Board Certified Teacher stipend from $1,000 to $3,000. And that's really an effort to um, recruit and retain our nationally board certified teachers. Our health insurance rates have increased, so we'll be contributing 7% more of that. Um, Virginia retirement system remains unchanged. Okay, I'm just going to highlight, um, I know you all have seen this list, so I'm not going to go through every one, but I'll just highlight a couple for you. Uh, the first one, the CTE, um, that's our career and technical education, uh, teacher and high school program coordinator. This is um, something that we are, um, we had several teachers from Mary Ellen Henderson and Meridian come together and they're creating a sustainability academy. And so this is lines up very well with us, our ultimate goal of continuing with our IB um, program, which would include um, a career and technical piece to it. And so um, these teachers have been re really working around the clock on the side to try to create this sustainability academy and do all these things. And, and it's, it's grown and the school board is very supportive because the school board feels career and technical education is something we can really um, do, we could do better on. And so this is going to be something that will su be supporting those teachers and helping really uh, our sustainability academy get off the ground. The, you'll see the neck at towards the bottom of this slide. You'll see about math instructional support. One of the things we um, found was after COVID, uh, there were dips in scores from online learning, but they were more significant in math. And so, what um, the, these would be, we assume we have part time math instructional support uh, positions, but we will be re increasing those to full time so that there's more math support for our students as they continue to catch up after distance learning. 
uh, one of the things that we, you know, when Dr. Noonan and his staff create the budget, they go and they'll talk to the staff. And one of the things that the staff really talked about was the need to have uh, have more support for substitute teachers. That's been really, Dr. Noonan was just in at uh, Oak Street Elementary last week subbing. Uh, so we are really hurting for substitutes. And so one of the things that the teachers told us would help them is to have permanent substitutes at each school. So this will give us, each school will have one permanent substitute which will float around. And we think that will give uh, them a lot more support. And uh, another, another piece of this working conditions is playground supervision. These are all things that we hope will support our teachers uh, in, the, in the work environment. And so providing more support at recess so that teachers have a little bit of a break and some planning time during the day. Okay, and then uh, wrapping this portion up, uh, two new positions we were gonna um, bring on, and this is really in direct response to COVID again, is, is a school nurse and also school psychologist. So these are things that we see um, we need um, in social, emotional, mental health well-being is something that we're continuing to work on and help support our students. And then just having that nurse um, for everything, you know, that's, that's percolating with, with COVID. So that, those are two things I think will really help our students and our staff. All right, and just some other quick school investments. Um, we're gonna have a preschool registrar, uh, some technology, equipment and services, uh, tuition for the students that attend Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology, covering that tuition. Okay, and we're gonna talk a little bit about reductions. Um, we have a salary lapse of 400,000, and that's when people leave their uh, positions and they're uh, higher, they're more experienced, and so when we hire uh, younger and newer teachers who have less experience, we are able to pay them less, so we've had some salary savings there. Um, we have less people uh, uh, receiving the retirement, the transitional retirement program, so we saved some money there, and so you'll see some other areas where we've saved some money. One-time funding and year-end balance. This is really interesting. One of the things that was, um, that I think is still in the budget was the construction do we know? <laughs> I'm looking at, fingers crossed. There's, um, there, there is something in the budget that is gonna include one-time funding for school construction grants. And this is important to us because Oak Street Elementary if, um, is the only school that has, does not have ADA entrance to it. It's just stairs. And um, the other piece, it's also the only school that doesn't have a secure vestibule, vestibule outside of the school system. So every, I mean, outside of the school building. So every other school, you walk into when you check in your, with your driver's license and they run a background check. If you don't pass that, you're, you're not inside the building. So you're on your way. The problem with Oak Street is the, the security vestibule is inside the school. So once you're, in, you're already inside the school, if you don't pass that background check through the, through the system there. So that is something that is concerning to us. And so we're hoping that, that we'll get that 1.2 um, million for that both the ADA compliant um, entrance and that security vestibule. So fingers crossed that that comes through. Um, and then looking at year end balance, $600,000 going towards the HVAC replacement, Mary Ellen, Hun Mary Ellen Henderson. And then also we are uh, exploring collective bargaining with our teachers. Um, I'm sure you all are aware that, um, be, uh, that the uh, previous General Assembly cleared the way for collective bargaining. And we are speaking with our teachers about that and exploring that and we anticipate as we move through that process, we'll need um, legal help with that. So we put some money aside for that. And then this is the chart that you've all seen, which basically summarizes what, what we've talked about this evening. Uh, and again, 86% uh, of our budget is going towards salaries and benefits. And so our advertised budget is a 6.8% increase. Um, and again, that's 6.3% coming from localities and then 0.5 coming from state aid for a total of a 6.8 increase. And just thanking you all again uh, for your support of the high school project. Uh, we are returning $100,000 to the general government. And uh, we understand that the lower bond financing costs um, lower than projected was a direct savings to our taxpayers. So in closing, I'd just like to say that, you know, by Virginia Code, Dr. Noonan develops a need-based budget. This is what he came, he, um, just to give you a quick summary of how that works, he talks to the teachers and the principals and they, from each school, what their needs are per school. 
and they try to whittle it down and then he will bring it to the school board and all of when there are requests made they have to e either be IB for all um, caring culture or um, equity so those are our three main pillars and so all budget requests need to fall in line with those three main pillars and uh, we feel confident that these are really um, the needs that we have right now to both recover from COVID and make sure that our employees are, are compensated and support our staff. So thank you very much, and we're open for questions. All right, well, thank you very much. Why don't we go on to the city budget, and then we'll ask questions as, as they may arise. Thank you. Mr. Shields? Well, good evening, uh, members of council, and um, it's great to uh, follow our colleagues from the school board, and this does mark, I think, the fourth year in a row where we've uh, had good planning at the beginning of the budget cycle and uh, revenue sharing information, and we've tried to follow the spirit of cooperative and, and uh, well-informed uh, revenue sharing uh, uh, understandings with the school board and the general government. And I think that's helped us both develop uh, budgets that are more planful, more predictable, and hopefully uh, uh, more um, uh, good, you know, better produces better results for both the, the uh, city council and the school board. Uh, before I uh, go, go through the numbers in the budget, I would like to just make a few introductory remarks. And, and I think we got a little bit of a taste of that just tonight with some of the comments that the chair of the EDA made about staff. Um, and about the dedication of staff, also seeing our library director here uh, and having the word spoken by the library board member about our library staff. Uh, we're gonna talk about numbers tonight, but fundamentally what this organization is about is about people. It's about um, employees and community working together to accomplish a lot of uh, really difficult, but also uh, transformative things. So before I start in the budget, I do want to start with some people, and I want to give some thanks uh, to key staff who make this budget pros uh, possible. Uh, Kieran Bawa, our finance director, is the, the sort of the captain of the ship. I get to present the budget, but Kieran does most of the, the really clear-headed thinking that pulls everything together. And her deputy, uh, Melissa Ryman, as you go through this process and you ask questions about the budget, you can guarantee that it's going to be Melissa Ryman who's going to be providing us the answers to those questions. She has complete mastery of the city's uh, finances. Cindy Mester with her development of the CIP. And this year we've got uh, a nice new thing. We have a, a movie about the capital improvements program. And so I want to thank Michael Timpain uh, with uh, the cable television uh, station for producing that for us. And, and we'll share the link for that um, um, and and. Next week, we'll be doing a deep dive on the CIP, but I think that movie helps explain it to the public. That was featured last night, wasn't it, on the yes, Oscars? Yes, it was. Yes, yes in the I Oscars, thought, yeah. exactly. So this is actually um, looking forward to next year's nominations. The, um, so let me mention two kind of big things that are going on, I think, that you'll see in this budget. Um, there is a tension in our organization, and, that's, and it's a tension between um, the ultimate accountability to do the basics of government competently in a manner that's affordable and that meets expectations of the community. These are the fundamentals of governmental service, about public safety, about making sure the trash gets picked up, um, all of the, the basic things, the streets get paved. So we have the, the need to do the basics competently and well. And at the same time, we have uh, the opportunity right now to do a lot of transformative things very difficult things. We're building a city uh, in the former uh, school site. We've got really significant economic development happening. We have grants across the board that are going to help us with environmental sustainability, help us with stormwater. Um, all of these are changes that staff have to be very sophisticated in working through in order to accomplish those big transformative things competently uh, and well at the same time. So that tension between the basics and transformation is, has been sort of the dynamic throughout this entire budget development process. A second point I'd make before getting into to the details of it 
is that this has been the most dynamic budget environment that I can ever recall. Uh, from emerging from a pandemic, and you'll just recall just months ago, we were having the worst hospitalization numbers and, and, uh, and case numbers that we had through the entire two-year pandemic just, just about two months ago. Um, we've got a war overseas. We've got major issues going before the General Assembly relating to fundamental issues about how we are, um, about our revenue streams. We also have incredible opportunities. Uh, well, actually, on the negative side, let me just finish one more. We have cost inflation. And for the first time in a generation, we're dealing with cost escalation of the likes that we, we're just not familiar with. It's very difficult to budget in that environment. On the positive side, you know, going back to the General Assembly, uh, the City Council has gone to the uh, General Assembly to ask for help on stormwater. We have uh, a bill pending that might provide some additional relief on, st on stormwater um, uh, for the City of Falls Church. So that's a, um, uh, something that's uncertain, but on the positive side. And then, again, the grants. And we'll come back to this, and we'll go through this in detail next week about the grants that we have been able to bring to the city, city council and staff working together, which is going to allow us to do so many good things uh, for, for the taxpayers of the city. Next slide. Actually, how do I draw this? I can advance this. Okay. <laughs> Let's see if I know how to run this. There we go. Okay. So um, some, some of the key investments that uh, this budget makes. Uh, we just heard the budget presentation. Um, and so uh, uh, I want to thank our colleagues from the schools for that. Again, the core government services focusing on the basics. I want to I spend more time than, than I usually do in the budget presentation on what we need to do that. And, and a big part of that is investment in our workforce. Uh, public safety, uh, including police, but also fire and building safety. Those are key features of this year's budget and areas of change. Uh, walkability and traffic calming, continuing the City Council's uh, focus on that, and that's where these big grants come really to bear and, and uh, important investments uh, in this area. And then flood, mit flood mitigation, continuing implementing the recommendations of the uh, Stormwater Task Force and uh, bringing in new ARPA and grant dollars to accomplish what we had been planning was going to be a doubling of the rates, which is not necessary um, because of those grants. So um, we'll talk about in the, that in the context of revenues. So I'm going to cover revenues on the, the back half of this presentation. Uh, but I am proposing a, the budget that is, that is before you would reduce the real estate tax rate by 8.5 cents. Now, that's in a context of rapidly increasing assessed value, so we'll go through that in detail. So I mentioned at the outset that this is a very dynamic environment. Uh, week by week, big things have been happening that have changed our outlook. And so um, in sort of humility of that fact, uh, uh, working with the CFO, the budget that you have also has a million twenty, a million twenty thousand dollars of contingency to work through uh, through the budget development process before you adopt in May, but also potentially just to keep uh, set aside through that the fiscal year to deal with contingencies as they come up. So this is a kind of the the uh, the overview of the operating budget, and again the capital improvements program we're going to focus on next week. So this uh, tonight's focus is largely on the operating budget, but I do mix in a lot of the capital projects in later slides just to tell the story of what we're accomplishing in the coming fiscal year. Overall, the school transfer is growing by 6.3 percent uh, to a, a FY 2023 20, local, locally supported budget of $46.6 million. The general government uh, general basic operations is growing by 6 percent. Uh, the contingency uh, that I mentioned just a moment ago of a million $20,000 is the next line that's not built into the, you know, that's, that's in the tax rate, uh, but it is, it is um, uh, not built into that operating budget in the line above. We're sustaining the $100,000 that the City Council has been putting to affordable housing, so no change to that in this proposed budget. We have pay-as-you-go funding, which is built into the, to the tax rate of, of, uh, to, for investments in fleet, equipment, 
and uh, property maintenance of $550,000. One area that I do want to spend time on tonight, this is kind of getting back to the basics of doing development and uh, building construction safely and effectively in the city. We have a surge of economic development coming through our processes, so we're using those permit fees to meet that surge. Uh, the pension ROI, the council always calls for that to be uh, called out in the budget, so that's the ongoing benefit of the contribution to the pension fund from the sale of the uh, uh, water system proceeds that was done several years ago. It's the equivalent of about a penny and a quarter on the tax rate of returning benefit for the taxpayers. Uh, debt service is going down slightly, about $1.2 million in the coming year, and that's because of a refinance of uh, some debt that the council authorized and, uh, and other debt coming off of our books. Capital reserves, uh, we're, we're having a slightly lower reliance on capital reserves, but you'll recall part of the financing plan for the high school is to draw down on capital reserves to cover debt service using the, le the, the sale, uh, the, the ground lease proceeds from the West Falls project. So that continues in this budget. And then lastly on this list, built into the operating budget is, is uh, 1.38 or $1.4 million of operating dollars that are coming from the America Rescue Plan. So the bottom line is a budget that is growing 7.6% uh, overall once all those things are, are wrapped in. So I'm going to focus on, um, on things that we're investing in in the coming year first. And uh, so let's talk about kind of the first, the big picture. Where do the, where do the dollars go? So uh, we've heard from the school board on the school budget, and that um, is the, the largest uh, part of the city's local budget uh, with 42%. Debt service is right now 12% of the operating budget. And, um, and that's right now kind of just gotten back within the parameters of our old traditional uh, limit on debt service. We did exceed it for two years uh, in the initial financing of the high school. Then sort of going around in terms of the, the, the different shares of the budget, administration, sheriff and court services, uh, public safety is police and fire. That's 15 percent of our budget. That's the second largest component. Public works is 6 percent. Recreation, parks, and library is 5 percent of the budget. Health and uh, human services, 4 percent. Um, building permits and uh, inspections and planning, that is 4 percent of the budget. And then uh, that contingency that I, I mentioned just a, a moment ago, along with other transfers, is 3 percent. So I want to talk about investment in employees. So we've talked a lot about that over the course of the past year. And this has been a year in which we've really experienced uh, a lot of the things that are happening uh, across the country in terms of uh, dynamism in the workforce, people being uh, uh, very uh, willing to move to different jobs. And we've experienced that in the city of Falls Church. And we uh, know we need to invest in our workforce to keep talented people here. Um, in the past year, we, we dipped as low as 15 percent vacancy across the board in terms of vacant positions. And most acutely, we experienced that in the police department, where we had 25 percent vacancy in September. We've since uh, hired back all those positions, so we're now fully staffed again in the police department. Uh, DPW operations, uh, we uh, have 21 positions in, in operations. These are the people that uh, fix, our, you know, fix our streets, keep our, our sanitary sewer system operating properly, pick up the leaves, do all of the, the crucial work, take care of our buildings. Um, that was down to, not, uh, to eight people, basically one-third of the staffing level. That was kind of where our most acute um, uh, problems were in terms of vacancies. So investment, the City Council did support uh, management in trying to address these issues last December. Um, and we did a 3 percent mid-year adjustment, but we also made targeted um, improvements to pay in DPW operations and in police. This budget continues that with an across-the-board merit increase of 4 percent for city employees. So 3 percent from December plus 4 percent with this budget from a budgeting perspective is a 7 percent increase in compensation, and that's what employees will experience in their paychecks uh, with some additional um, uh, pay for police and DPW operations. We set aside $200,000 to fund the recommendations of the compensation study, which is ongoing right now. I don't know if we'll have data ready by May, uh, May adoption time. We're working very hard 
with our consultant so that we will. But in any event, we've set aside $200,000 to address their recommendations. Professional development is an ongoing need and uh, for any organization. With the pandemic, we cut that budget. This year, we're restoring $35,000 for professional development. Um, health insurance is 163K. Basically, we have the same program as schools and experience those same 5.3% or 8.2% for Kaiser uh, increases uh, to those premiums. That's a cost share between employees and uh, the employer, the city. Um, not just uh, compensation, but what really is important for staff is having the tools they need to be able to do their job effectively. So we make key investments in this area, new equipment for DPW, um, uh, some fleet up, uh, updates, also in our garage with two safety issues, replacing bay doors and the lift, which is used to uh, take care of school buses, but all of our uh, trucks in, in the garage, $250,000. Those are largely funded uh, pay-as-you-go or with capital reserves. Investments in technology uh, includes two new positions. And one, this is sort of getting back to this, uh, focusing on the basics. This past year, we had an upgrade to Munis. It, uh, it was probably the most disastrous software upgrade that we could have imagined. Uh, and it's something that, uh, an experience that we shared with the school staff, because we, sh we share the same ERP, or, or financial system. Uh, so we're proposing a, 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 a new position that would serve as, as the technical advisor for all staff citywide in interfacing with Munis. So this is the treasurer, the commissioner of revenue, finance department, uh, permits function. Those are the sort of the super users. Um, one of the big weaknesses that we've had in trying to unravel these problems um, with Munis over the past year is not having dedicated technical support in-house to deal with those issues. So we try to address that. Um, the library is a very high-touch technology zone with uh, most of the patrons coming in, interfacing with technology in the library. Uh, they have felt, I think, for years a bit underserved by ITS because ITS has so many responsibilities. So we want to have a dedicated technology librarian uh, to, to uh, support all the public-facing technology in the library as well as the backbone technology for the library. Lastly, I'll just say on, in the area of cybersecurity, one thing that I think is a, a big efficiency is in the past year we've made a $30,000 investment to have outsourced um, uh, security monitoring for the city's network. And uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail, but I think that's a very uh, for a very reasonable cost, which we jointly procured with surrounding smaller jurisdictions, including uh, the towns and the small cities of Northern Virginia. I think we've come up with a very cost-effective uh, way that with a pretty big step forward in terms of our cybersecurity. Okay, so shifting to public safety. Um, uh, the, sort of the bottom line is that this, this budget restores uh, two police uh, officer positions. And over the course of the past year and a half, we've converted two uniform positions to civilian positions for good reasons. One, we took an officer out of the police department to be our director of, of emergency operations. And secondly, uh, we've replaced one of the uniform command staff with a civilian command staff that will implement uh, and hold us accountable or keep us moving forward on implementing the use of force committee recommendations, but also to advance our work on accreditation and all the proofs of compliance of our changing policies, making sure we have the proofs of compliance throughout our department, which is the backbone of accreditation. So those are the changes we made in the past year to meet those needs. Now we'd backfill that uh, with two uh, police officer positions funded in this budget and, and the target for those would be to get an officer back in the schools with a school resource officer and have dedicated traffic uh, patrol. That will get us back to the 34 uniform positions that we had prior to making those two uh, shifts to civilian positions. In the area of building safety, this is a, probably one of the most dramatic aspects of change within the operating budget. So we would deploy the very significant revenues that are coming in from building permits. So Broaden Washington and the West Falls project between the two of them are generating uh, several million dollars in new fees. So we would take 1.1 million of those to staff up so we can handle that surge. Last year the council approved three new positions, actually probably the last two years we've, we've brought in three new positions to manage uh, our permit activity. We stepped that up with six new positions. 
And so uh, four of those are on the core function of plan review and inspections and permit intake. And then two of them are to help support the whole team. One of those is a planner that will do compliance of voluntary concessions and site plan compliance out there on, on the street for these major projects. And the other is IT support. Uh, our, our permit function is technology heavy. Uh, they're super users of our technology and we give them dedicated support. So uh, if these are funded, the permit reserve will be able to cover these for the coming three years with projects that are already financed and advancing. It is not dependent on projects that are just in the entitlement phase right now. Okay, so the, shifting now to just kind of areas where we are uh, out in the community making transformative effects with, with projects. And so let me just cite a couple of examples of those. Uh, right here on Park Avenue between the library and the State Theater, uh, undergrounding all the utilities and putting in streetscape and, and all the amenities of a, a safe, walkable street. That's the Park Avenue project. That's under design. The Shreve Road Safe Routes to School uh, for a, a safe route from the WNOD all the way through uh, the intersection up to Haycock Road. So that's a, a good, viable, and safe route for students to, to get to school. Another grant-funded project. Uh, South Oak Street Bridge, uh, replacing that bridge, that's going to have major impacts on school operations, so we need to coordinate that because uh, we'll have to close Oak Street. Uh, but Council Member Snyder might recall when we were dedicating the bridge um, uh, on the WNOD that uh, VDOT was there, and they said, hey, we do project management if you all want to take advantage of our services. And so we followed up on that. We have VDOT that's going to be our project manager for the Oak Street project, which puts some relief on our project management for other projects. Uh, we heard comments uh, over the past several months, but again tonight, about traffic calming on Lincoln. So we have a combined stormwater improvement project and traffic calming project that will uh, cover Lincoln Avenue. Uh, that's under design in, the, in this, uh, uh, in the, in this uh, year's budget. We actually have um, additional funding uh, for that coming from a grant gotten by Don Beyer through uh, uh, our community uh, priority project, as well as uh, some other grant dollars that will augment that $2.5 million. Um, and then lastly, we're using ARPA dollars for sidewalks across the city and bus shelters. Um, sidewalks in, in, uh, in particular, are, I think, are a key part of our traffic calming program. Um, and so that uh, $1.4 million in federal dollars really will be on, on top of the $100,000 which, which is built into the tax rate. Uh, for our ongoing sustained neighborhood traffic calming program. So here's some still on the same theme of, of major transportation projects, projects that are under, uh, which we will go out to bid on in, in uh, coming months, uh, the North Washington Street and Columbia Street intersection improvements, the Hawk signals to cross uh, Broad Street, the WNOD crossings, the Annandale and South Maple uh, intersection. That's the roundabout project that the council was briefed on about a month ago. And then, of course, projects that are under construction right now. Uh, this is the South Maple and South Washington Street intersection. That continues the streetscape and all the walkability improvements we've made throughout that corridor down to the South Maple intersection. Uh, the West Falls Intermodal Project, that's the $15 million. That money is being spent right now uh, by the Falls Church Gateway Partners, and, and the utility wires are, are coming underground right now as we speak. And then uh, the South Washington Street, that's finally wrapping up. Uh, the uh, uh, informative panels will be going up soon. The stormwater infrastructure has just been put in in the last month. And we're really, really looking forward to that long-lasting <laughs> project coming to a uh, close. And um, so those are some of the kind of the big projects on the transportation front that uh, we'll talk about in more detail with the CIP next, next Monday. In the area of equity and, and inclusiveness, um, tax relief for seniors, veterans, and disabled. Um, this is right now, if we make no changes to policy, um, it's $535,000 to cover the policies that we have right now. So we talked about that council contingency in the first slide of this presentation. We'll talk with the treasurer about possible changes to that policy, policy uh, with council, and the council contingency could be a way uh, to fund that if that's the decision to go in that direction. We're sustaining 100 k uh, for affordable housing. That's really to match the very significant grants through the Amazon 
uh, REACH Virginia program that we're administering right now. The Community Services Fund, we've traditionally funded that at $80,000 a year. We use ARPA dollars to augment that up to $150,000 a year uh, to meet uh, new needs that are coming through the CSF. Uh, continuing ARPA funding for household assistance, funding for the regional capital area food bank with using ARPA dollars, and then using CDBG dollars to help rehab some of the Virginia Village uh, quadplexes that the EDA has title to and, and uh, uh, which we are, are responsible for uh, currently. Um, a couple of investments in small town character. Um, we mentioned this just uh, with the EDA uh, chair, but the uh, flower baskets and the banners and those uh, tree lighting and those types of things are paid for through that hotel tax and that's continued um, in this year's budget. Park improvements. Um, and then uh, we do have kind of the most sacred thing that we do as a local government is administer local elections. The Board of Elections has asked for a conversion of a part-time deputy into a full-time deputy, and this budget uh, does uh, respond to that uh, Board of Elections uh, request. Okay, so now we'll shift to revenues. Uh, what, what was intended in the prior slides is just to provide some highlights of the budget, and we'll, this is a 300 and 20-page document, and so we'll be, over the coming weeks, going through many more details, but I just wanted to hit some of the, uh, the key areas. So on the revenue side, how do we pay for these things? Um, and this is just the operating budget. Um, real estate taxes comprise 56 percent of the budget, um, and then going kind of a clockwise around the horn, the next 40 percent of the budget really comes from the commercial sector. So those are meals taxes, sales taxes, the commercial sector. Of, uh, of real estate taxes. And then the final 20 percent are charges for service, like rec and parks fees, building permit fees, um, and then lastly, that use of fund balance, uh, which we mentioned in the first slide, which is used to cover a, a portion of our debt service um, until the, the peak of debt service, uh, we've gotten past that. Some of the trends on, on local revenues. Uh, with the reduction in the real estate tax rate that we mentioned on the first slide, real estate assessments are going up significantly, but the, uh, the dollar amount change would be 4 percent. So we'll talk about that in more detail in just a moment. Personal property is also an area where there's a lot of increase in assessed value that's happened very suddenly. And uh, so we're projecting 6.6 .6 on that, but we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail momentarily. Sales taxes never did decline in the City of Falls Church through the pandemic. And that's largely because the grocery stores have been such an important part of our retail sales environment, um, as well as internet sales. Meals taxes in this budget are still below the pre-pandemic level, but they are, you know, it's a 42 percent increase. That's just an indication of how much we cut it in the budget uh, going uh, into the pandemic. Business licenses, the only thing to note on that is that a big chunk of that growth is coming from the construction activity in the city. Uh, when developers are building buildings, all their contractors are getting business licenses in the city. Uh, so local taxes are strong in this budget, and, and uh, that's, that's given us some of the flexibility to do the things uh, that we need to do in our operating budget. Okay, so assessed values, we put out the press release uh, just about two weeks ago, and uh, assessments now are showing up in people's mailboxes. You can also go online right now and, and see your assessment. But for on the residential sector, overall, is 13.7 percent growth. And on the commercial side, overall, 5.7 percent. That includes apartments. So if you take apartments out, the commercial alone is growing 2.6 percent. Um, new construction is uh, $34.6 million, and that's a combination of Founders Row, principally, and the, uh, and the, the teardowns and rebuilds that you see out in the neighborhoods. For the first time in the city's history, we've crossed the $5 billion mark in terms of total assessed value in the city. So a penny on the tax rate, just in shorthand, generates $510,000. Regionally, um, you know, our AV growth is, is uh, kind of in the middle of what you are seeing uh, in the region, with some of the largest increases out in Loudoun County and in Prince William County, all at double digits. Uh, closer in, Fairfax County is kind of more similar to what our growth rates are. And then inside the Beltway is where you have some of the 
the slower growth and assessed values just in, in this market cycle. And, um, and so just wanted to share that regional information. So on the real estate tax rate, um, what is proposed in this budget is a tax rate of $1.23.5, which is a reduction of 8.5 cents. So uh, if it were not for any change to the tax rate, the average homeowner in the city would be experiencing about a $1,400 increase in their tax bill. So the 8.5 cent reduction is about $730 reduction to, to that impact, but there is still is, and I think this is really something we have to kind of work through with the community, still is a significant increase in the tax bill, about 6%. So uh, we, we share that information. We also share it in the context of what the trends have been. And so, um, you know, generally speaking, over the past several years, we've been reducing the rate. Uh, last year, we had uh, we managed to keep the impact on tax bills uh, at just about 100 percent. I mean, $100 for the average taxpayer uh, increase was the impact last year. Uh, this year, it would be larger than that um, uh, based on the, the budget that's before you. In terms of what's happening regionally on tax rates, you can see that uh, uh, just about everybody is either holding them flat or reducing them to some extent due to the increases in assessed value. And so the city of Falls Church at the eight, eight and a half cents is kind of more similar to the Loudoun County or those western counties that I described that have the sharpest increases in assessed value. So uh, on the commercial and an industrial tax. Um, I mentioned that commercial is going up 2.6 percent. Um, if we cut the tax rate by uh, eight and a half cents, then the average commercial tax bill would, would go down by about 6 percent. Uh, what I am proposing in this budget is a C&I tax. That's a commercial and industrial overlay tax of five cents. That could be, uh, that would generate $400,000 and it can be used exclusively for transportation. Um, so things that we have needs for in the area of transportation, obviously we have a, a huge transportation program and our capital improvements program, uh, but this would allow us to meet capital needs from WMATA, help us cover our bike share uh, costs as those grants um, expire. Um, we can cover sidewalks and other uh, and, and, uh, and expansions of the transportation system. So um, if this is enacted, this, if this proposal is enacted by the City Council, it would be a net 3.5 cent reduction for commercial taxpayers or a, a 1 percent decrease in the average commercial property tax bill. Car tax, that's just one other thing that I think we need to have a conversation about as we go through the budget. Um, the extraordinary blue book valuation increases, uh, the Commission of Revenue has brought that to our attention. It's something that everybody in the region is experiencing. You know, some vehicles are going up by 40 to 50 percent because of uh, the demand in, uh, for those vehicles and the uh, microchip problems and supply problems for new vehicles. That's a temporary phenomenon. We don't think that's going to last. Uh, that's going to work its way through the system. So we're not recommending a change to the rate, but rather uh, we'll review options that the, that the region is doing. And so essentially, like what they're doing in Loudoun County is they're taking that for, for cars, they're just saying multiply it by 0.85 or 0.9 and then just that'll be the valuation or that's the, that'll be the tax calculation for this year and then we'll assess again next year. Uh, so I think there's some pretty simple solutions out there that we can discuss um, uh, as, as we go through the budget process. On the stormwater fund, so I'm going to start at the bottom of the slide. The, the key thing is we're, we're moving forward with the major CIP projects. Uh, we're going through design right now. We, we uh, intend to execute in the coming months, starting really with the Lincoln uh, project, which is part of the watershed for the Trammell branch, and that, so that project will be one of our lead-off projects. The kind of the main thing is two years, we were talk two years ago we were talking about doubling the stormwater fee. Because we're using grant fees, we won't need to do that. Um, we are uh, experiencing inflation, however, just in the basic maintenance of the stormwater system. So we're asking or proposing a 3 percent increase in the fee. That would be about a $7 impact on your average uh, homeowner's stormwater fee bill. On the sanitary sewer fund, 
Uh, we do have uh, kind of one of the big policy issues we're going to bring to council just in a few uh, weeks or months is the purchase of additional capacity from Fairfax County to handle growth. The way that we pay for that uh, purchase is through developer fees, through the availability fees that developers pay. Uh, so that's kind of one of the big things that's in the CIP. We have not raised uh, sanitary sewer rates, which covers just our basic operation, not that expansion, just the basic operation. We haven't touched those rates since 2016. We are now, um, you know, feeling the pinch of, of uh, cost increases, and so we're asking for a 3 percent increase to sanitary sewer fund uh, rates as well. I've got just a, a slide or two on ARPA just to summarize. Uh, the Council's been working through policy on ARPA really since um, uh, this time last year. Uh, our, our, um, this budget would continue with uh, the, the plans that were discussed last fall. And so between the CIP and the operating budget, there's $3.7 million of ARPA dollars in this FY23 budget. That's 21 percent of the total allocation. Uh, we do need to encumber the funds by 2024 and expend them by 2026. So we look forward to that discussion. Uh, some of the things that are in the operating budget uh, include this list here, uh, and it's for general government and for schools to sustain those things that we uh, were funding in, uh, in, in the current year's budget. And then on the CIP side, kind of the big thing we're doing on the CIP side is funding sidewalk, new sidewalk across the city with $1.4 million. And then at the community center, uh, $1 million to replace the now 25-year-old HVAC system at the community center, doing a strategy very similar to what the schools have done with it, uh, using ARPA dollars for HVAC replacements um, at school facilities. So to summarize, uh, uh, look forward to working with the City Council and the community over what, uh, again, is a, a budget that does have these, these tensions of making sure we're taking care of the basics, even as we are working through big transformative projects. And, and, uh, and I look forward to working through tactically how we attempt to accomplish that with this year's budget. Um, in terms of the process, some of the key Things will be um, key information that people will have. We can go to these website links to get information. And again, we do uh, have some videos of, from every department director. So this is a kind of a key thing for the community and for city council. Uh, or rather than having every department director come before city council for a budget presentation, we do those virtually. We have the videos posted. And, um, and then we can use our time together on strategic uh, deliberations and question and answer. Uh, the next steps, uh, we've got a uh, budget town hall that will be on Thursday. It will be a virtual town hall meeting on Thursday, March 31st in the middle of the day at noon. On uh, the 4th, as I mentioned, we'll talk about the CIP, but also Council will be talking about these tax rate ordinances. So we want to bring those to you for your uh, review at work session on April 4th and then uh, set the stage for first reading and advertising the tax rates at your meeting on April 11th. Uh, we have our second uh, budget town hall on April 21st, and that will be in the evening. That also will be a virtual meeting uh, to facilitate everyone's participation in that. We're targeting May 2nd as a final adoption. We have pushed into May for the first time in, in uh, I think, our memory anyway. And early May is preferred because I know the schools have a lot of obligations they need to make in terms of teacher contracts and the like, uh, which is why we're trying to push it for early May. So that uh, ends the presentation, and I'll uh, be happy to answer any questions and look forward to council engaging with you on this over the coming weeks. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Shields. Um, there's a lot of information there, and I know there's going to be a lot of questions both from people on council and the public as a whole. I would just remind everyone that this is the start of a pro the process, not the end. And so uh, we may not get all our answers tonight, but I think the main thing is just put the issues and questions out on the table and then with all the follow-up you just saw on the schedule. So um, why don't we go ahead and open it up to questions uh, from council. Does anyone want to start? Ms. Conley? Thank you, Mr. Shields, Dr. Noonan, and Ms. Downs for the presentation on the budget. Um, this has come a long way since the joint meeting that we had in December, and as the pieces fall into place, it's really nice to see how we'll be able to deploy them 
uh, for the benefit of our citizens. So I just want to urge everyone to take their time and not make any grand proclamations about what's going to happen because there's a lot to learn still. And um, I'm looking at all my homework for the next couple of weeks, and there definitely is a lot for all of us <laughs> to review and learn. And I'm sure we'll have a lot more questions. But I do, I thank you for those presentations and for your thorough description of things. I have one question for Ms. Downs, and that is there's this extra chart for Dr. Noonan. This chart that is was with the school board presentation that, um, can you just give a quick description of that so that as we prepare our our questions and answers, we know what that is. Sure, a quick description of this, and I'd like to thank Kristen Michael, our Chief Operating Officer, and Michelle Kopek, our Budget Director, for helping pull this together. Um, it was mentioned in the presentation that Ms. Downs uh, gave that um, there we are looking at regional salary comp uh, competition, and one of the school divisions that we look very closely to uh, within that um, context is Arlington. So what you'll see on this is um, the Falls Church City Public Schools proposed um, salary scales on the front along with Arlington's salary scales, uh, and this is just the teacher scale. And then if you flip it over to the back, you'll see in red those areas where we're, we will be falling short uh, based on our proposed, um, our proposed budget. So um, what was mentioned earlier was that in some cases uh, in Arlington County where they are doing a compensation study they may be recovering as many as four steps for their employees uh, for past misses. And we're, we're proposing a, a two-step uh, recovery, or a one-step recovery, excuse me. Does that help? Yes, thank okay, you. Great. Um, and then a question, I guess this is for Mr. Shields. Last year we had a great, uh, in the past, we've had a nice chart of what, not just what Fairfax County pays in taxes, but also different towns and areas pay different fees to compare to what our tax rate is. And I'm hoping that will appear at some point in the next couple of weeks as well. Yes, we will prepare that and uh, get that circulated. Great. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Ms. Hiscott? Just a few quick ones um, while Dr. Noonan's up there. Um, one of the bullet points we kind of skipped over, and um, having worked on the bond referendum as a volunteer in 2017, I just wanted to compliment you all on when we presented that to our community, we went door to door promoting the bond referendum. We noted to our residents that that would cost a seven cent uh, increase on your tax rate. And not only have we not increased by seven cents, we've been decreasing since then. And I think that's due to a lot of the work on the, um, from the council before me on economic development and a lot of good stewardship from the schools. So uh, we, we didn't go through all of the points there, but that was one that personally I think is pretty important um, that all of our residents understand that when we decided as a community to vote for that bond referendum, we were looking at it as a seven cent taxing increase, and uh, we're not going that direction, thankfully. So I just wanted to point that out. And then um, looking at this salary study, this is after we make our increases and with the estimated increases from Arlington, correct? That's correct. Uh, I know you've just done some research to find those out, but have you had a chance to see what it would take to keep us competitive with Arlington? Uh, I don't know that we've necessarily done that analysis, um, but I, uh, you know, I, we could we could seek that. Uh, I think that would be interesting in light of the, doing the staffing um, comparisons on the city side too, to make sure that we're competitive in the region. To know that it's great that we're able to move forward with what we did, but if it's just continuing, or if we continue to be behind and our competition is pri primarily Arlington, it'd be interesting to see. Um, based upon our current staff distribution among step and experience levels, what that would cost us. Mm -hmm. You so can see, see on the, the right-hand side of the, of the um, table that shows Falls Church City Public Schools compensation as a percentage, that the right. range in there is, is um, somewhere between 0.085 all the way up to, in some cases, nearly 27% discrepancy. So uh, without, you know, doing the math, just know that it's some somewhere in that range, um, but it's pretty significant. Yeah. So it'd just be interesting, you know, if we have all master's teachers with 10 year, you know, on the mm -hmm. 10 year step, we're still, we would still look okay. But if we had all, you know, or the majority of 20 years right. and PhD, you know, you know what I'm saying? It'd yep. be interesting to see, um, based upon our current staffing levels, what would keep us competitive. Sure. Um, and then I'll, I'll hold my other comments till we Others ask um, them of you, Dr. New. 
Uh, Mr. Snyder. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, Superintendent, you, know, you mentioned during your presentation and the chair of the board about 10 students uh, from Ukraine. Um, is there anything that the general government or the community needs to do to further support those students and their families? And that's an ongoing request for please keep the communication open as to what the needs are. Are there any unmet needs at this point that you're aware of or can you keep us advised uh, as the situation uh, develops? Thank you, uh, Council Member Snyder. We appreciate that. Um, of those families, the vast majority of them are um, State Department families that have come back. Mm -hmm. We do have some, um, at least two that I know, refugee families, um, or refugee students that are here. We are connecting with social services currently, um, but they have good connections um, here in uh, Falls Church, which is really helpful, but we certainly will keep you apprised. Okay, and also the State Department families, obviously, they they have needs in our schools have been consistently open for that. So anything, refugees, specifically Ukraine, but generally across the board, Afghanistan and elsewhere, please keep us advised as, as needs develop that you see. So yep, Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, a couple questions for the city manager. Just um, w one area of, of interest that I'd like to see developed are the reserve funds, the use of those funds. Um, the fact that we remain um, probably carrying the highest debt load we've ever carried in the history of the city. And so maintaining adequate reserve funds is something critically um, important um, in that circumstance. So any comments tonight, but in the future, I'll be interested in seeing that um, fleshed out a bit. And if I could just mention, so with the CIP next Monday, uh, we will talk about uh, all of our funds, the Budget and Finance Committee did a review of all the city funds just to kind of have that roadmap. But the key one is the capital reserve fund and how we're financing uh, these, these big capital projects. And so we'll spend a lot of time on that. Okay, thanks. And then finally, I think slides 9 and 10 where we talked about mobility. I want to recognize the work of city staff and Cindy especially. Um, there are big dollars involved in transportation, and I think that underscores the council's commitment and the city staff's commitment to uh, active participation in the regional bodies there. I think you're talking about literally tens of millions of dollars of grant money that, uh, that, that we're using for those purposes. So um, thanks very much for, for these, just some initial uh, questions and comments. Ms. Hardy. Thank you. Um, thank you all for the presentations. There's a lot to digest here. Um, I'm gonna start on the school budget. A um, couple high-level thoughts. Um, appreciate everyone coming in at guidance, and again, the continued strong partnership. The new high school is beautiful. Um, another place that we've had great collaboration over the years, um, especially earlier on in my um, council career, is capital planning. And so with these latest enrollment projections where we have declining enrollment and actually staying below 2,500 students, I think for the next 10-plus years, um, while we may have kind of ongoing CIP needs, do we have school capacity CIP needs? Mm -hmm. Um, and so I guess a different way to phrase it is how long is our current school capacity going to last us? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, um, Council Member Hardy. Um, and just to clarify, I, it, it's interesting to see kind of where our current enrollment numbers are. Um, so the slide that was shared by Chair Downs was our September data. We actually are um, continuing to grow. Um, we're bringing new families in and we're beyond uh, where we were in September, and we're, and we're currently beyond where we were last year. Um, and so one of the things that we, and, and I'm going to get to your question, I promise, um, but one of the things that we're really interested in partnering with the city on, potentially, is the idea of hiring um, a, on a contract a demographer to help us really get a better understanding of what our overall uh, enrollment is going to look like as some of these other places come online, whether it's Founders Row 1, Founders Row 2, you know, Broad in Washington, and certainly up near the high school. Um, so that being said, without knowing exactly what the, the growth is going to look like, um, but anticipating that we are going to have some growth, even um, though the Weldon Cooper numbers maybe show that it's fairly steady, um, for now, we are in really good shape from a capital perspective. Um, I'll be working with our COO, uh, Kristen Michael, over the next year or so to look at a capacity study just to make sure that we're 
where we need to be, but we did um, take great pains when we built the high school to include some extra square footage that could ultimately peel, be peeled off for a variety of different purposes. Um, so for example, on floors four and five, we have space available to create six new classrooms. The capacity at the high school is more than the student population that we have right now. Um, so from a secondary perspective, we're in pretty good shape. I think the risk that we will face down the line really will be at our elementary, our two elementary schools at Mount Daniel and at Oak Street. Um, but if our, if our numbers do stay fairly steady, we should be okay. Um, but, but again, I think having someone come on and work with the schools and potentially with the city uh, ge general government and thinking about, um, thinking about it from a more refined perspective through a demographer, we may get a better handle on that. Great. I would certainly would support that. I think in-house we actually have pretty good data on how our mixed use is performing and actually down to a pretty precise level can project the number of students and I think we've come in pretty accurately. But if we think that a demographer would help us, especially in the single family existing neighborhoods, that would help. Uh, but I think ultimately I'd like to get to a how much room do we have in each school so that we can do that CIP planning in the out years. I don't think anybody wants to inherit all the capital needs that we've had to deal with the past six years. So, uh, Second question I have is really around um, salary competitiveness. So that's obviously a shared priority across general government and the schools. Um, and I know that Debbie's already asked this as well, but um, I think it's the Wavy Guide that comes out. Mm -hmm. um, how are we ranked currently in that Wavy Guide? Um, I, I'll have to um, send that to you. That is in the budget documents that were prepared for the school board. So if you go to that school board question and answer link, the Wavy Guide is in there. Um, I don't have it off the top of my head, but we'd be happy to, to reshare okay. it. Hopefully with the step and the makeup step and the COLA, we stay kind of in that top one, two spot that we've always shared with Arlington. We, we have a um, uh, Northern Virginia uh, Region 4 Superintendents Council where we share data privately before um, we come out with our budgets uh, or our proposed budgets. And um, there are some pretty large salary increases that are being given um, across uh, Northern Virginia. So I think for us to remain competitive, we, we um, you know, we're going to have to do, we're going to have to do some work. And one of the things, and I mentioned the capacity study, we are in the pipe for also a, a salary study um, this time, um, not this time next year, but hopefully in, in time for the budget next year to be able to uh, take a look at that. Great. And kind of a corollary question is, um, as you've heard from Wyatt, I think we've had an attrition issue and a vacancy and high vacancy rate on general government. Has that been a concern in the schools as well? And how can we support you on that? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I would say that through this pandemic, we've done extraordinarily well comparatively to um, our surrounding jurisdictions. We're seeing a rebound um, of teacher candidates for positions. There was a time where we might get seven, eight, nine teachers for a singular position here in the city of Falls Church. We certainly aren't getting that now, but we are getting three or four. Um, and so that, that gives us a sense that there is a robust um, candidate pool out there. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. I think one is certainly our facilities. The other is the size of our school division. Um, another is our, just our community spirit and the fact that our students do really well. So we are, um, for example, last week I hired a teacher in from Arlington. I've got another teacher that I'm interviewing tomorrow that's coming from Prince William. So even with some of these other things coming, we're getting some um, trans transition in. That's great. Um, I'm going to hold my questions for Wyatt just so that someone else can ask Dr. Noon while he's there. Mr. Duncan, did you have a question? If you don't have any, that's... I do. Uh, Ms. Leon? Yes, thank you um, uh, very much for all of this information. Um, the one question that I wanted to ask was, with the FTE investments of new staff um, in this presentation, does it impact the student to staff ratios? Are, are we changing that dynamic with the investments in headcount? Um, we will still staff at the same levels. However, um, what we'll likely see with a, a few of those positions in there, um, a reduction in some class size. But the vast majority of the people that are in this budget are um, folks that are specialists in reading, specialists in mathematics, that mm. are providing support and push in structure. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, I've got a question for both uh, you and Wyatt, and 
pardon me if I didn't see the actual information, but I know you all are doing a step increase and a cost of living increase. Do you have an idea what that total number sort of blends out to, a percentage number that blends out to? And then I'd ask why the same question. I know we had a mid-year increase and all that, but just so we can sort of sure. get numbers on both the fronts. Sure. Um, our employees, um, if, if, if they're eligible for a step, a cost of living adjustment, and the additional step, the recovery step, that um, the first step is 2.7%, the cost of living is 2.25%, and the additional step is 1.9%. Um, uh, the reason that's less is because not everybody qualifies for that. So if you are eligible for that step, that COLA, and that additional step, that nets out to 6.86%, which is um, slightly less than what the general government is offering. So, and if you don't get the step, uh, you know, the missed step, what's the number? Uh, you're at 4.95. Okay, and Wyatt, um, I know we got a little bit of apples and oranges here with mid-year and, and, and the like, but why don't you give us a, a take on general government increases? Um, sure. So we did a 3% merit increase, and we're proposing a 4%. So it would be a 7% uh, increase taking the two together relative to where we started in FY22. Okay. All right. Mr. Duncan? Thank you. Um, I wanted to shift gears just a little bit, but thank you for your comments, Dr. Noon, about the attributes of our school system and community that make us appealing, uh, even against Arlington. You know, it's funny. Um, we spend a lot of time talking about economic development here, and there's one consistent theme that you hear. It's, well, we don't want to be like Arlington. We don't want to be Boston. We don't want to be... Well, we want to be courthouse, you know, uh, and yet at budget time, well, yeah, no, we want to be exactly like Arlington, <laughs> and it's true on the general government side too. You know, it's true with law enforcement, teachers, and so forth. And there's there's no solution to that. It's just uh, I'm pleased that we were able to catch up to Arlington. I think they weren't paying close attention or something. And as soon as they find out that we're paying pretty much the same as we are, then they're going to increase theirs because uh, they're able to do that. And uh, that's just a challenge that every council will have to face, I guess. But it's nice to hear that, that there, the efforts that we've spent on facilities and building that community spirit around our schools are, are, are paying some dividends. Um, I wanted to ask uh, uh, Mr. Shields uh, about the ARPA uh, item uh, that you focused on in your uh, slide. Uh, you know, we've done some great things. We've worked hard on economic development, good management by the schools in the city. Bravo for us. We're also lucky uh, to have the ARPA money that we can, you know, draw on. And there's no getting around that. And I'm, I'm just concerned for those who come later that we not commit ourselves to positions or functions that are ARPA funded that we'll need to sustain after the ARPA money has gone away. And I'm wondering if in your budget or maybe Dr. Noon's budget too, there's any, you know, flags that we need to be aware of and, and plan for now so that three or four years down the line we, we don't end up with the ARPA deficit basically in local, uh, local re revenues. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And um, so first, you know, just, you know, one thing, Mayor Tartar was chair of the NVRC at a really critical time when the region was lobbying uh, our Congress people just to make sure that those allocations were fair for small jurisdictions and that that uh, was effective and um, and so the city is uh, along with all the cities uh, in Virginia I think uh, is, is has been helped quite a bit by ARPA so as we go through this budget process I think there's two kind of things we need to keep a real close eye on is the use of this permit reserve because that you know, we view that as a surge of activity. We don't think we're going to have this amount of economic development or building activity forever. Um, and so we're using those reserves. So that's one area where those dollars could not be here three years from now. So that's kind of one area to pay close attention to. And then the other is the uh, ARPA dollars and making sure that those don't get embedded permanently into our operating budgets. Now, we have made some critical decisions that we needed to make to respond to the COVID pandemic. And so we have some posi positions that are funded with ARPA dollars. And, uh, and those are listed in that chart. But as we go through this budget process, we always just want to be mindful of 
of, of what that means for the two years out, three years out. And Dr. Newton. That's true on, on both the school, uh, general government side and, and on the school side. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't know that I can say it any better than uh, City Manager Shields did, but I, I would just say that we're very clear that the money that we're using, particularly for recurring costs, which is a, a dangerous thing to do, uh, but we are very clear with everyone that we hire that it's on a, a temporary part, um, per, temporary short-term basis. So, uh, and that's actually written into the contracts that we're we're giving people. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. okay, we won't. We should not face a, a cliff, if you will. Cliff. Thank you. Good phrase. Uh, thanks. Okay. Uh, shifting gears. Another question I had. Uh, I think mostly to Wyatt. The CNI uh, assessment that you're proposing. We'll talk about this in great detail. But I just want to make sure that the business community understands. Uh, what that is, how it differs from and is disconnected from the B poll tax. Are there any opportunities for B poll tax relief as we impose a CNI tax? Uh, uh, just your initial opening thoughts on that, I think, would be that that'll be an item of, of interest, I think, in your budget, particular interest in your budget. Right. So I, I do think, um, you know, when we have our work session next week, I'd like to get council feedback on that. I do think it's um, it, it presents a, um, a, a fair approach on taxation given sort of the discrepancy between what's happening in the residential sector and the commercial sector, um, and, uh, but we can go through the details on that. But just to be clear for those who are listening, this would be on the owners of real estate, and, um, and so to the extent that those pass through to tenants, then mm -hmm. we need to be very mindful of what that means for our small businesses. Um, but you know, the, the people who pay the, the real estate taxes are the, the landlords or the, the people who own the property. And, and so that's where this would be focused. In this budget proposal, we do not have uh, proposed changes uh, to the business license tax rates. Okay, thank you. Uh, before I go, uh, <laughs> I just want to thank uh, both of you and everybody on staff who's been involved in putting this together for presenting a budget which you know, balances our in insatiable appetite for excellence here with the realities of uh, affordability. We talk a lot about affordability as it relates to, uh, you know, lower income folks, but affordability is, a, is an issue for many, if not most, families in the city of Falls Church at some level. Uh, and I think uh, the tax rate that you have uh, proposed for our initial consideration is, it would be the lowest uh, since I think uh, 2010, I believe. So we're talking 13 years since the tax rate has been as low as what you would propose here, which is, you know, because of a lot of things that we've talked about already. Um, but that's important. I, I, I must say, I must ask uh, what the equalized tax rate would be. Uh, what's, what's the number uh, that the rate would be if we uh, threw off uh, as much? Any guesses? So we, uh, we print that number. It's part of the advertisement for the tax rate. Ms. Bawa, have you done that calculation? I'm sorry? I can't hear you. And this would be the, the rate that uh, you wouldn't need to, that would essentially be neutral to a tax payer. Right. Current assessments, the new assessments carried in well okay we can so, obviously so we'll we'll have that number for yeah right you could have I, just just for just for giggles i uh, went into the online uh, uh, to see my assessment and i use my house not because it's exceptional because it isn't exceptional it's very typical you know two bedroom brick cape cod built in 1948 added to here and there but not in any major way uh, bought for $102,000 in 1985 and now worth $980,000 according to the most recent so I figured that my tax rate, in order to match my bill from last year, my adjusted or new tax rate would have to be about 109, <laughs> which is, that's a whole lot less than I thought even a week ago. And I'm not suggesting we're going to go there, but uh, it is useful to have that number as a bracket, I think. Um, right. Am I, am I pretty close? So, Ms. Uh, no, you're, you're special. You're exceptional. Um, but so the equalized rate uh, across the board would be a dollar nineteen three. Ah, uh -huh. so that would be a twelve point uh, seven cent reduction. Okay. Yeah. Now our house twenty percent increase was. Oh, that reminds me of one other thing. Um, there is, I think, going to be a lot of interest in assessments this time. 
We have a new assessor. We had a process that we went through. We have high confidence in him. I understand all that. Uh, but there are going to be people who are going to sort of, wow, really? Is this a typo? And I just want to make sure that our communications efforts are aimed towards making sure that when those people call City Hall with a question, uh, somebody picks up the phone and, you know, gets them in queue if they can't answer it right off the bat. But I think it's as we go through the budget process, it would be helpful uh, for the community to have confidence that the assessment uh, was accurate and also that the, if there are any questions that uh, the staff is able to respond to them promptly. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, Mr. Snyder, Ms. Connelly, and Ms. Hardy. Sure, th thank you, Mr. Mayor. A um, couple things for the city manager. Um, considering the volatile environment in Richmond right now, uh, talk of, uh, well, not, more, not just talk, but action and on the grocery tax and potentially other things, have you taken that into account uh, with this budget? So as we were going through um, trying to develop budget recommendations for the City Council, as I acknowledged and as you just did again, it's been such a dynamic environment. So many things have changed so quickly, week by week. And that is the reason why there is a contingency of the size of a million uh, and twenty thousand dollars in the budget to help the council deal with. I think it, you know, if past trends of ho will hold over the coming weeks, there's still going to be additional shocks that will come, new information from the general assembly, and I think we're just going to need that flexibility as we go through the deliberation process together. So that was the intent uh, with that contingency. Okay, so in essence, you're building some of that volatility in right now in terms of the contingency, which if things turn out well, we can reduce the tax rate even further. Theoretically, if turn, things turn out badly, we may need to, to use that. So it seems to me that that's a good approach right now. Um, th secondly, thanks for the balancing, including the, uh, the lower tax rate. I, I think uh, for the reasons that Council Member Duncan said that that's important for everyone. Um, finally, um, again, on the positive side, thank you for building back the police department. Uh, that's absolutely fundamental to why people have government and what we're paying for as, as taxpayers. So uh, thanks for building that back rapidly um, and uh, to focus on traffic law enforcement as well um, in the budget. Um, those are the comments I had right now. Thank you. Ms. Conley. Thanks, Mayor Charter. Um, Mr. Shields, you mentioned the charts that we did in, uh, that Ms. Bawa and Ms. Michael did in Budget and Finance Committee related to our reserves. C what page are they on in the budget book? 61. 61? Okay. Great. Thank you. So those are new charts that haven't ever been in the budget before. Right. Okay. Thanks. Ms. Hardy. Thank you. Um, so building off what Dave Snyder said, um, to clarify, is the grocery tax currently in the budget? So the, um, as we were going through the process, uh, what is to say? So we are expecting that the General Assembly is going to make us whole in the grocery tax. That is the answer to your question, yes. And so that's built in, then it's not like a separate contingency thing, unless that they take it away suddenly, then that's where we would use that's the contingency. Where, that's where that, the contingency that is there would be used, that's right. And based on reading the tea leaves now, do we think that this is something they'll do year after year? Ms. Mester, what is your tea leaf reading on this? Mm. I think for the next two years, it may be year by year, because I'm not <laughs> seeing consensus to build it into code. But I do sense that we, there's a strong effort to make us whole. Yes. After April 4th, and they call the special session back, and uh, we see some more outcomes. I'll reread the tea leaves, but yeah. I mean, they but, can't really put it in, you know, I mean, they can't bind future um, legislatures on how to spend money and the like. So I think, I mean, hopefully they can institutionalize in some way, but short of it being in the Constitution, the Virginia Constitution, I think it's going to be pretty challenging to legally ensure that it can't be used in other purposes uh, going forward after this two-year cycle. Yeah, code could always be changed, but it's harder. But the budget is exactly like you all. You can't bind a future governing body. I, I just wanted to add that the this while the general government's budget is built 
without the or with the grocery tax. The school division's budget was built without the grocery tax. So we were under the impression that the 8.4 percent um, growth really needed to we really needed to look at it as a 6.2 to 6.8 percent growth. So if indeed the um, the the city as a whole, general government and schools are held harmless. Um, we, we would be interested in continuing that conversation because we did build it without the grocery tax uh, included. Thank you. Why I still have more for you. Um, you're not done yet. Uh, Mary Beth had asked for kind of a chart comparing um, our property tax rate with kind of add-ons compared across jurisdictions. If I could expand on that request, um, given that we are talking about the car tax, stormwater, sewer, can we look at that for all the taxes that a resident may pay? Um, and then now with the CNI, being able to look at that with the same kind of filter across the jurisdictions. I think it's important to look at the total picture. Okay. Um, I think Dave Tarter asked this already, but um, I'd like to know uh, the salary increases that we're doing, which I think you mentioned for general government schools, but compare that to our neighbors for the work session next week, if we have that available. Um, the senior tax relief, currently the budget shows like it does not include um, anything in there. It's only the existing program. If we were in a model, um, expansion of the program similar to what our neighbors are doing, I'd like to know what that impact to the budget would be. I do think that in light of the rising assessments, um, I want to make sure relief goes to those who need it the most. Uh, let's see. Oh, so uh, reflecting on all the great work on transportation and mobility on slides 9 and 10, as Dave Snyder pointed out, this adds up to more millions than I can count. Um, so grants clearly are great, but I want to make sure we also have people to do the work um, I think one challenge that I continually hear is that we have the grant funding, but it's stuck in procurement or we don't have enough project managers. And so I want to make sure that we are right sizing staff with the actual grant dollars we have. And so I'd like kind of staff's assessment on whether that's something, again, could be paid with one time dollars, for example, right? Like they may not need to be evergreen FTEs on staff, but if it's getting through similar to clearing the queue that we did with NTC, if we need to clear the queue with some of these mobility projects by hiring short term one to three year contractors, I'd be interested in um, supporting something like that. Um, I think that's it for now. I have more to digest after we do our homework. So thank you. All right. Any additional questions? Um, this is, as I said, a first bite um, at the budgets, and there's plenty more to come. Um, but this has been very informative, I think, for all of us, hopefully the public as well. There are, as you heard, town halls and the like coming forward. And so there's plenty of opportunities for public comment um, and questions and the like. So. Ms. Hiscott, did you want the final word? Oh, no, I'll let you speak again after me. You should always have the final word. Um, I, I echo a lot of what's been said, and this is just the first step, and I appreciate you acknowledging the tension beto between trying to deliver top-notch basic services with a lot of the things that our community is really looking forward to moving forward with, like environmental issues, affordable housing, um, equity, uh, supporting refugees, and providing different types of housing and different abilities for people to live within Falls Church City. Um, I think it's really important that, um, you know, like one of our public comments tonight was about um, making small sacrifices on our tax front in order to ensure that we can provide a community where other people can live. So, you know, it, uh, you know we talked about the assessments, and I understand that that increase, um, you know, but you've got 800, and Phil's, Phil's <laughs> it's example, you know, $800,000 in generational wealth to pass on in theory to, you know, to your children that you've been able to make because of living in Falls Church City, which has expanded so well and developed so well. It's not like that in other parts of the country. Um, many of you are from other areas originally or my own property in other areas. Your taxes are going up, but your assessed value is not increasing that same rate. So where you may not be paying taxes at a high rate each year, the net value of that property hasn't increased like it has in North Virginia and Falls Church City specifically. So please just, you know, I ask people looking at their assessments, keep that in mind as part of their overall financial picture. And just rest assured that your council is trying to make sure you pay the lowest amount of taxes and we deliver the most services and we include the highest number of people into our community that we can by investing in affordable housing, investing in mobility, investing in transportation, et cetera. So um, that's all I wanted to add to the conversation tonight. Thanks. Can I say one other thing? Yes. Senior tax relief, it was mentioned, but I think uh, there's uh, unanimous interest in hearing more about that as we go. So I just wanted to put that marker in. 
include and including the low income into that's what for those who may not be familiar with what Letty was referencing earlier it's expanding senior tax rate to affordable um, you know and I know that our uh, treasurer is looking at what our options are and how much that would cost on the tax rate thanks all right so I think that will do it for this conversation I propose we take a short break and then get back at it so thank you all uh, we appreciate this so much and look forward to hearing more from you and further conversations so we're going to stand on uh, recess for about five to set ten minutes. What? <laughs>